So the topics that we looked at there yesterday in the tutorial on investing and saving, we're going to take up today in today's class and look at a bit on how money grows over time and how we quantify that. Okay, so one of the key things in engineering is the central role that economics plays. Many of you will go work in, in various areas, um, so pharmaceutical, petrochemical, paper mining. Um, your focus in those different work environments will be quite different. Some of you will be looking at the chemistry side of things. Some of you might be involved in risk management. Um, some of the colleagues that I graduated with look at uh, modeling and predicting the cost of electricity and energy on the market so that they can save their company's money by buying, buying uh, by using electricity at times when it's cheaper. So you may get very analytical. You might be in safety of the environment. You might be more involved in the legal side of your company. Some of you might go into technical sales. No matter which role you take in your company in the future, I can guarantee you that you will be using economic principles fairly frequently. So this course is probably the only course that you get at engineering economics. Those of you that are in the management stream, you would have taken some economics courses. Um, so you may have taken some business courses in, in high school. We're going to look at economics from a little bit of a different perspective. So even the management students, you'll see a, a bit of a different spin on this um, to what you've seen in your commerce courses. So uh, let's, uh, let's recognize that, that economics uh, takes a central role in pretty much every part of our uh, lives, um, both professional and personal. On the professional side, we're going to look at engineering economics. I'll talk a bit about that uh, in more detail coming up. But the key objective that we're going towards two, three weeks from now is being able to evaluate various economic investments. Is it better to do one, uh, invest in one project versus another project? So how do we make these decisions in our companies? In your personal life, though, the tools we're going to learn in today's class and over the next few weeks are very very applicable. So I use them regularly. Uh, I just bought a new condo a few months ago. I did a fairly detailed economic evaluation on that because I dis my decision then was, do I keep the house that I just paid off or do I sell it and then use that money and buy a condo? Okay, so there was this decision, buy or sell, and then I evaluate the income I'm going to get from my tenants versus the mortgage that I have to pay off in the condo. So this sort of economic decision making is very, very easy. To apply to personal, um, to personal aspects of your life. We spoke yesterday about the high debt to income ratio in Canada. So some groups found numbers of 1.5, so Canadians spending 50 cents more than every dollar that they're bringing in. Some groups found the value of 62, 63 cents. So borrowing is a necessary part of our lives. We, we never get past that, right? None of us will usually have enough money accumulated to just pay outright cash for a house or a car. We're always going to be borrowing. Throughout your life, you're going to be carrying some form of debt, most likely. But there is a way to, to deal with that and, and calculating the numbers on what reasonable ratios of borrowing are versus saving. But the most common decision you guys are going to face next year is how fast you start paying back the student loans. How fast should you start investing in uh, savings for retirement, right? So you've got these competing demands for your money. Do I pay back my loans or do I start saving money away for retirement and investing for down payments on a house or a car? So how do you make those decisions? You can apply the same tools we're learning for engineering economics to your personal life. Um, and then in, for those of you that are more in the management stream, you're familiar with this concept of cash reserves and rates of returns. Um, so we'll, we'll not go into that detail in this course. Uh, that's why you've taken the management stream if you've elected to do that, because you're interested in those, and uh, so that terminology will be important to decide. That. So here's a, here's a good example of this that Dr. Marlin has written up. Um, he's asking here that when you start in a new job, your boss comes and, and, and is asking you and your group, potentially, to evaluate whether um, or how you can increase your production rates. So here's a distillation column, you're feeding a certain material, a certain composition and flow to the column. There's vapor stream leaving at the top, the liquids at the bottom, there's the condenser, the reboiler, you're comfortable with this flow sheet. 
But there's one problem right now, is that we're at capacity. We cannot increase the vapor or liquid flows. Okay. Another way, another example might be that if you want to increase the capacity, this reboiler that you have here won't be able to meet the job if you in just indiscriminately increase the flow to the column. Right? So that reboiler might be at capacity. The condenser might be at capacity. So you're, you're, you're constrained here. You have to spend some form of money if you want to go ahead. Well, some of the options that you might consider is building another distillation column in parallel to this. So maybe a smaller one that's of half the, half the size of this, or maybe a full size one, depending on how much you want to increase your production rate by here, we've said 35%. So is it worth building a whole new distillation column? Could we maybe retrofit that existing column's trays with packing? What does that do if we add packing to a, to a tray? What's going to happen there? Take our tray and our distillation column, we now add packing into it. Previously it was empty, we just had vapor and liquid flowing in between those trays. Now we're inserting packing. Two things. What might happen? Is that going to benefit us? Will we be able to increase our capacity? No. Yes, no. Okay, I'll post a reading about this. So you, you, you're obviously not quite 100% clear on this. But I'll post a detailed reading on the course website on the use of packing in distillation columns. Yes, it will improve our uh, our ability to separate because we're going to increase our, uh, our contact area okay, so we can potentially then ramp up our production rate but also one concern then is that we're going to increase our pressure drop through the column so now we've got packing in there increased pressure drop, increased utility costs so in addition to the cost of the packing itself we're going to have ongoing maintenance costs starting to, to come in here with this option we could look at increasing the number of trays. So there's a capital cost there, um, the cost of installing that. We could look at an option of where we say, well, I'm going to contract out my production to another company. This might seem unusual to you, but this is actually fairly common in the pharmaceutical industry especially. The name brand drug that you buy isn't necessarily made by that name brand company. That company just due to capacity constraints will often outsource the production of that drug to another third party, put their own label on it and, and sell it as their own. You see this in the grocery stores all the time. You can buy the no-name brand fruits or uh, juice, for example. It's exactly the same, produ the producer of that is the same as the name brand. They just put a different label on it. So you can always look at an option of contracting out your production to another company. Or you could look at altering the, con the conditions on that column. So different set points for the, for the various trays. You can look at the different temperature profiles of your reboiler, at your condenser, and that might potentially impact. But each of those options here are going to involve some form of capital cost and some form of operating cost on an ongoing basis. Okay, so here we've got five decisions. Which one do we make? Which one is going to cost us the least amount of money to implement and going to get us our desired increased production. So this is where we're, where we're heading in this over the next uh, three weeks or so, to be able to make these decisions. So uh, this uh, slide is similar to the next one. I'll rather talk uh, about the next one. So our four major topics that we're going to look at over the next few weeks is First, in today's class, we're going to consider the time value of money. Okay, so money value does not stay constant over time. It, there's definite variation. $100 today is not worth the same as it is, is a year or two from now. Uh, if we take inflation into account, if we take interest into account. So how do we uh, compare dollars at different times? We're then going to look next week and, or maybe even by the end of this week still, the measures of profitability. So you've all, you've got an intuitive sense of this, right? If you needed to buy a, um, a car, it's going to cost you $10,000, let's say. How fast are you going to be able to pay that car back? So is it going to take you two years? Is it going to take you one year? So what is the payback time? 
And one way we intuitively evaluate investments is we pick the one that's going to cost us the, or that's going to get us the fastest payback time. So which one can have payback the quickest? That's going to be the more preferable selection. That's one measure of profitability. There's return on investments and there's net present value calculations that we can do. So there's very simple and very sophisticated calculations that uh, can take place over there. The reason why we're going to do that study first is that we're going to use that here or there in section three. When we need to compare alternatives, we're going to make that comparison based on one of those measures of profitability. We're going to pick the alternative that works best for us. And then the final part of this section is how do we estimate those costs? Right? So here we're, we're estimating how fast we're going to be able to pay back things, but really we don't know up front how much things are going to cost us until we actually pay for them. Well, we can't go ahead and pay for our investments. What the best way to do it is to let's estimate what that cost is going to be ahead of time, and then I can make a decision based on an estimate and then implement the, the project that will be, have the, the best measure of profitability. So this is an important part is this estimation. So how do we estimate the cost of, say, a distillation column or a heat exchange? Um, how much is steam going to cost? How much is water going to cost? How much is oxygen going to cost? Um, so what are the various uh, inputs into my process? My, um, my operators and technical staff, they're going to cost me money. How am I going to evaluate the, the cost of their uh, salaries? Okay, so many, many costs that we're going to look at here in section four. Then we're going to bring all of those together, as you can imagine, all of this ties together and we're going to do uh, a fairly detailed assignment in about three weeks from now. Your, you and your group will be doing a fairly detailed assignment where you estimate all the costs, you would estimate all the incomes, you take all the taxes into account, you take depreciation into account, and you're going to evaluate a, a whole flow sheet. Um, and you're going to do that in your course project as well. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's take a look then at, at time value of money. So time value of money is really just a balance on our money over, over a period of time for a specific project. So very important is that we classify or, or, or define our boundaries. So we're used to this from our 2D course, right? Define your boundary that you're going to work around. And typically in engineering systems, that's a project. So it might be a project to increase your distillation column capacity by 35%, might be the project. And if you look at that project, we're going to consider the revenues coming in, so additional sales we're going to make. Maybe that uh, we're going to get licensing fees coming in, we'll talk about that in a few classes from now. But then, what usually of interest here is the revenues. If we're looking at that project, what is our extra fee going to cost us, how much utilities for fuel and electricity, um, employee salaries. And so over that project we do a balance of money coming in, money leaving. And ideally we would like money accumulating inside that balance. We want our profits to be growing and growing. We don't want uh, a negative. Okay, so here, here's one way we're going to, to look at our projects. We're going to look at our cash flows over time. Okay, so Cash flow is something that, um, how many of you are familiar with that term from, from business areas? Okay, a few of you. So let's talk about cash flows. Cash flow then is the net, so sum of, in other words, the sum of money flowing in minus money flowing out. So sum of your revenues coming in minus your expenses within a time period. So very important is that we've got this concept of time running here and we've got individual periods. That period is of a certain duration. Typically, in our course and for engineering projects, that period is one year. So here's a duration of one year. And what I do is I consider all my money flowing in, in that one year period, all my income, minus all my expenses in that one year. And I take this the net value. So if I've, made, if I've made a profit that period, I'm going to have a positive. If I've got a loss that period, I'm going to have a negative value. So ideally, we obviously would like positive cash flows. But 
recognize that negative cash flows almost always occur at the start of the project and then we become profitable later on. And so what we do then is we take this period of time, we sum up our income minus our expenses and then we draw a vertical line that's proportional to the amount of money. Okay, so let's say I had a profit here at the end of this period, it's a positive value, and then I can, I can add a y axis here, so let's say that might be $1,000 of profit. At the end of period two, I may have $1,500, and so then I have a vertical line that's a little bit longer than that. We're going to use this regularly throughout the next few weeks. So the key here is that it's simple lines, positive or negative, depending on the net of the revenues and expenses. Now, the next important thing is that recognize within one period of a year that there's multiple cash flows that occur at different times. So a year is a long, long duration. We need to make some form of assumptions here. And the, the assumption we use at standard is that Within that period, there's multiple cash flows, multiple incomes, multiple expenses. We take the sum of them up, collapse it down to a single bar at the end. So the net flow of cash within a period, so this could be day to day or week to week, we've got incomes and expenses. We combine all of those, sum them up, positives and negatives, there's some cancellation, and the net of that is reported at the end of the period. So this value of $1,000 here is the net cash flow for that year. And this is going to trip you up later on uh, when questions start being phrased at expenses coming at the beginning of the year, income coming in the middle of the year. People get quite confused. The, the key here is you make a, an assumption. Our assumption is that we're going to work at the end of the period. Some textbooks might use the convention of working at the start of the period. We, we generally always work at the end of the period, take the net income, and uh, sorry, total income minus total expenses, so your net profit or net loss, and, and report that at the end of the period. So to add to that then, there's two other, there's two conventions of representing cash flow diagrams. We, we will use both in this course, but we will use the first one more often. The first is to simply represent the, the actual cash flow. So here was a negative value, a negative value slightly less. So let's say, for example, that was minus 1,000, minus 900, minus 400, and then plus 500, 500, 500, 500. So those are the net cash flows at the end of the period. We can also look at cumulative values. So that first bar here on this cumulative is probably the same as the first one here, but then I add the, the previous bar to the next one, and I get a, a, a larger negative, a larger negative still, and now I start adding positives and I get some cancellation, and I get my cumulative cash flow diagram. Okay, so this is useful to see when this crosses zero. That's obviously very interesting for us. It's that period of time where my income and my expenses meet each other. That's a useful point in time to know about. That's why we will use the cumulative cash flow diagram sometimes, because it gives a nice visual representation of when we break even. So that zero crossing point is the break even point. Uh, is a term that most of you are familiar with. Any questions up to now? So the question the last bar over there. Why do you want to see a magnitude? Oh, this is just a hypothetical it's example of incomes and expenses. So for some reason here, the last period, there was a larger income than the So what I'd like you to do here then for a minute or two is uh, work on your own and Draw the cash flow diagram for your life from age 10 to age 40 and your expected cash flow obviously in the future for periods of one year. What would that look like for your situation?
and she'll give you the hundred dollars back. Is that a good proposition? Probably not because of inflation and interest. We got more money than that. Right, because of inflation and interest, that's probably not a good proposition. You as the lender are only going to get $100 back a year from now, but you could have used that $100 more efficiently elsewhere. You, as lending that money out, are deferring its use. You're giving it to your family member for her to use. You're unable to use that money. You cannot make it work for you. You're incurring some risk as well on that money. There's a potential she doesn't pay you back. So you can't use that money for your own purposes, you have some risk. That future money is worth less than the money now. Okay, so $100 three years from now is worth less than $100 now. And so that's an important concept. It's an important concept because our engineering projects happen over long durations. We spend a lot of money to build a chemical plant or to make a change to a chemical plant, for example, that distillation example of adding packing to a column or uh, purchasing a second distillation column to install in parallel. Those decisions uh, cost a lot of money now, and we only recoup that money many years from now. The profit from them takes a while to kick in. So when we're evaluating these economic decisions, we must recognize that there's a time aspect to these investments. We do not make the money back right away. If we made the money back right away, we wouldn't need to take time down with another time. But the fact is that these projects are over such a long period of time to make fair comparisons between different projects, and especially projects of unequal duration. So one project might, might pay itself back in two years, another project might pay itself back in five years. In order to fairly evaluate those projects, we must take into account the fact that money's value changes over time. Okay, so today's class really is all about characterizing how money's value changes over time. And we just call it, we call it economic equivalence. It's no different to engineering equivalence that we're used to. So for example, the fact that 12 inches is equal to one foot, or roughly 30 centimeters, that's engineering equivalence. Right? We're used to just exchanging one form of, of speaking in, say, inches to metric. We're used to engineering equivalence. So we're looking at money equivalence. Money equivalence between the future and money equivalence to now. So one way we do that is by using an interest rate. So this is also something we're familiar with. Both, how many of you have a credit card? Yep. OK. So we're used to interest rates of fairly large numbers. Let's take an interest rate of, say, 10% which is a real low interest rate. And if I took $100 now and I invested it at 10%, a year from now, what is that worth? $110. And it's not a trick question. So $100 now invested at 10% is going to be $110 a year from now. Okay, so $110 a year from now is equal to $100 now. You see that there's, there's that equivalence. Okay, so the way we characterize it is let's, we use that interest rate. So let's take $110 in the future, minus $100 now. So that's, we've made $10. And we've made $10 on the basis of $100. That gets me my interest rate of 0.1. In other words, 10% interest rate. So let's quantify this symbolically. So we say in the future, $110 minus the $100 that I have right now in the present, divided by the $100 I have in the present, is equal to the interest rate I. So then let's rearrange this equation over here, and we arrange it as saying F is equal to P plus PI. So this is a useful way of looking at it. So my value in the future is whatever I start with now, my $100 now, 
plus some fractional multiplier on that base amount, P. So PI is the amount of interest I'm going to earn. So in this example, that would be 110 is equal to 100 plus 10. So we'll work on this one quick. Um, oh, wait. It's, uh, there's nothing really that's new here. Okay, so I'll come back to this to just solidify the terminology at the end. But uh, let's take a look at these two examples that you can quickly work through and calculate. This should take you no more than a minute. Um, either, both examples should take you a minute each. So work through those and calculate example one is asking you to find the interest rate. Example two is asking you to find how much you need to invest if you'd like $1,000 in the future. We'd like $1,000 in the future. I only have $800 now. I'd like to get $1,000 one year from now. What interest rate do I need to invest that $800 at to get $1,000 a year from now? Any numbers? Any interest rates? 25%. Okay? That's a straightforward one. So, so substitute into here F is 1,000, P is 800, and solve for I. 0.25, so 25% interest. Example two uh, looks at it from a different perspective. Given that interest rates are 4%, which is fairly realistic, um, from an investment perspective, we would like the future value of $1,000 a year from now. How much should I invest today in order to get that $1,000 in the future? Firstly, is it greater than 1,000 or is it less than 1,000? <laughs> no, it's less. You need to invest less than a thousand now so that you can get a thousand dollars in the future if you get receiving four percent interest. And you should find that that value that you need to invest right now is nine hundred and sixty-one dollars and fifty-four cents. So what we're saying is that nine hundred and sixty dollars now is equivalent to $1,000 a year from now in an environment where we can earn 4% interest on that money. So that's all, all that we're getting at trying to understand here is this equivalence between now and later. So here let's just uh, formalize this in terms of these cash flow diagrams. We're relating P, our present value, and F, our future value, over n time periods when there's compound interest. Okay, so now we're picking it up a step. We've just looked at one year. Okay, so what is the future value just given one year from now? Now let's take a look at it when there's multiple years from now. So we introduce this type of terminology F subscript N, which indicates that it's the number of periods into the future. So let's just take a look at what we've done so far. We've said, slow well, down. Looking one year into the future, that's F1, is equal to the value I started off with plus the interest on that one, one year. Now let's try and understand it from the second year's perspective. So at the end of first year, going on to the second year, so at the at this, in the second year, what is my balance going to be? Well, I'm going to start with what I ended off with the previous year. So at the, pre at the end of the previous year, I ended up with a larger amount of money, F1. Now I'm going to reinvest that at the same interest rate. What is going to be the amount at the end of year two? So I take my money that I start off with and I earn an interest rate I on that. So if I sum in F1, F1, that's equal to P plus PI plus I times P plus PI, we're going to get P plus 2PI plus PI squared. And we can show that that simplifies to P 1 plus I squared. So that's it's just a recursive formula where 
the amount F2 then is a function of the previous year. If I sum in the previous year's values and simplify, I get to this uh, simpler form over here. And if we do that a third time and a fourth time, we can start to generalize it, and that's where that formula comes from. That's over there on the slide on the right. Okay, so this is the, the, the principle of compound interest. We invest our money for one year, we earn interest on it, then I earn money the next year on the original amount plus the interest, plus the additional interest on that. So this money grows exponentially. Okay, so if we take a look at these questions, this is here on the left is often how these questions are worded if you read the textbooks. Um, but let's take a look at, a, at a, interpret the same question, just interpret it in a more useful manner. If you want to have $1,000 one year from now, two years from now, five years, ten years from now, let's say, I would like $1,000 in my hand. So many years into the future. How much should I invest now in order to get $1,000 at a future time point. Should I invest more than $1,000 or less than $1,000? Less, okay. So that's clear. Now, if it's far into the future, so 10 years from now, how much should I invest? A lot less or a lot more? A lot less because I've got 10 years to grow it. So if I want $1,000 a year from now, I would imagine that what I need to invest is going to be pretty close to $1,000. But if I want $1,000 10 years from now, I can invest a whole lot less, and that's going to grow cumulatively at an exponential rate to reach $1,000. So we can use that recursive formula up there and back calculate what that looks like. So this is most usefully done in a spreadsheet. All these spreadsheets I'll share on the course website with you for you to download, and you can uh, then look at the formula underlying those uh, numbers over there to see how they were derived. But this is, this is fairly straightforward then, is that that first block over there indicates that if I would like $1,000 a year from now, I should go and invest $909. Okay, so if I put $909 away, a year from now it's going to grow to $1,000. If I put $826 away now in two years' time, it will grow to $1,000, and so forth. So fairly, fairly powerful showing that only needing to put $386 away in 10 years at in a 10% interest rate environment that's going to grow fairly substantially. Okay, so make sure that you that uh, that you can re reduplicate that those numbers up there. Any questions on that? Compound interest is very straightforward and it is a powerful concept. Yeah. Is there any way to make 10% per year? Is there any like, realistic way to get that? No, not on a continuous, um, reliable basis. No, of course not. No, not in, uh, well, not in Canada. If you can invest in other countries that have greater than 10% interest rates at a, on a consistent basis, yes, you can. But then you, you've got the risk of their currency changing and devaluing and changing over the rest of the system. So what's the interest rates in some other South American countries? and in African countries. Where could you find that information if you wanted to know it? Okay. Take a look at, uh, it it's, it's appears in a lot of economic publications. The Economist is one. They'll publish every, every week, they'll publish the interest rates in different countries of the world. And you can quite easily see there's countries where interest rates of 10, 15, 20% are quite, quite normal. So, so that is possible, but just not in Canada. Okay, now these next two slides, 18 and 19, uh, we can explain inflation as it says there on the top, and the next one that shows this uh, diagram, please ignore that. It's, there's uh, some poor notation on there and poor wording, so I'm not going to cover that yet. I will get back to those later. Okay, so that slide over here, where is it? With that similar looking equation and hiding $10,000 uh, in your mattress, just ignore that for now. We'll come to that later. What we're going to look at in the next class is that we're going to look at how money now decreases in value in the future. So we've looked at interest, so how money grows if we're investing it. But from an inflation perspective, we can also see how money devalues. And I'll, I'll look at some examples of that next time. 
And we're going to look at balancing of inflation with interest in the next class. Okay, but where I just want to uh, finish up today is just formalizing this concept again that a future balance in your bank account is this very important formula where you invest a principal amount in today's dollars and it will grow at an interest rate I over n periods. Okay, so what I want you to, to be able to do, and you're going to do this in the next assignment as well, is simulate a bank account. So take income into a bank account, minus expenses, add interest to that, reinvest the interest, so that gets redeposited in the bank account, and gets reinvested for the next period and the next period. So set up a spreadsheet where you can simulate a fictitious bank account with incomes coming in, expenses leaving, and then interest being re-added to that bank account. So that example I gave at the start of the class where I was evaluating um, renting uh, my, my house out to tenants and, and buying a condo and paying interest on the condo, I've got income coming in for my tenants, but I've got expenses leaving for mortgage payments. Okay, so I, I created a simulation like that. In the next or an assignment from now or two from now, we will do the same from an economic, uh, from an engineering plant. So we've got money coming in from sales of our product minus money leaving due to operating costs. And we're going to then get interest on that and we're going to simulate that in the same, same uh, environment. So, so be comfortable doing that. Um, and it's fairly straightforward on a spreadsheet. <coughs> so, this, uh, this uh, plot here just demonstrates uh, this example. This example actually is $1,000 being invested at 10% per year, and we, we can watch it grow in value over time. So a year from now, that $1,000 is equivalent to 1100 and then in 10 years from now, it's worth about 2600 So it's more than doubled in value in 10 years. So this is uh, some, some interesting numbers that will hopefully pull in what we looked at in the tutorial yesterday versus uh, and, and combine it with what we learned in class today. Investing $10,000 a year at 5%, so prove this to yourself in a spreadsheet, that if you take $10,000, put it into a bank account, and you're earning 5% on that. That 5% interest gets added to your bank account at the end of the year, and then you also add in $10,000 the next year, in addition to that interest coming in. You earn 5% on that combined amount. The third year, you deposit another $10,000 into your bank account. Now you're earning 5% on all those previous monies that are in, in there already, and you just keep going. Every year, you still add $10,000. You get your accumulated interest. And you can show that within 35 years, that's just under a million dollars. Why did I choose 35, 40, and 45 years? That's pretty much the time frame that, that you're going to be retiring in. So yesterday's tutorial, we looked at retirement being in typically around 65 for Canadians at the moment. So that's pretty much the time frame for you guys. We also, uh, one of the groups calculated and mentioned a number of 1.5 million as the amount of money needed to retire if you were earning $100,000 pre-retirement. So I think that was David's group, right? You guys gave that uh, value of 1.5 million. So here's one way to get 1.5 million. 45 years from now is quite straightforward. You invest $10,000 a year. $10,000 a year is not a lot of money. It's less than 1000 a month that you put away. It's not it's not impossible at all, for, for when you, even for when you start working, or just um, a year or two after you start working. Putting that amount of money away every year and only 5% is fairly reasonable. Is 5% an unreasonable number? Let's take a look at the history. So you can get these charts pretty easily online. It's called an index chart. Um, it's pretty messy. There's a huge, huge amount of information on here. But essentially what it's showing is $100 invested in 1950, how it's grown all the way to 2011 is when this plot goes. Uh, you can get the more up-to-date one. 
So it shows various trajectories if you're investing in various stock markets, what that $100 will turn into. The interesting thing here is that it always goes up. So if you're investing in the stock market as a general index, so not in one specific stock, but you're investing in the entire stock market, so either as an exchange traded fund or a bulk um, mutual fund like that, your trend over the long term is up. Over the past 60 years, it's never gone down on a sustained basis. So that's good to know. Various indexes go up at different rates. The other useful piece of information is this number over here in gray. Inflation, cost of living. So in the past 20 years, if you guys have been around, that inflation has never peaked above 5%, except for a very short period of time over here. During your parents' generation, when they were, were uh, looking at investing and buying houses and, and so forth, that inflation was much, much higher. So that was in the seven, mid 70s, early 80s. That inflation was over double digits, so over 10, 12 percent. But for a sustained period of time, we've had very low inflation rates of around 5 percent. So that's a pretty reasonable numbers um, to, to work with. And so 5% is not entirely unrealistic. Okay. So, so that's useful to know. And I would highly recommend, just to end with the class today, I highly recommend that you go and give us a try where you plug in those numbers of $1,000 to $10,000 invested in 5% and make sure you can duplicate those values. Over there.